All of us hope that our descendants will inherit the stars and know that the dreams of humanity rest on shoulders of steel. Welcome and thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe, support us on Patreon if you can, and we always appreciate your comments and recommendations. The invention of steel was one of the most important technological breakthroughs for our ancestors. Humans had perfected the use of stones and wood for tens of thousands of generations. And this was all we had since about 2.6 million years ago when we find the first stone tools until about 42,000 years ago, when we find small amounts of natural gold being collected by humans in Spanish caves. But nothing intentionally worked or shaped. Gold can be very obvious in nature. It is very bright and easy to spot. It can be shaped and worked easily. It is resistant to corrosion and extremely attractive. Copper was the first metal to be recognized and collected in its native form or smelted from the surrounding rock about 7,500 years ago. The oldest metal tool found so far on earth is a copper awl, a tool for making holes in softer materials, and is about 7,100 years old. Very quickly, humanity came into the copper age, making tools, weapons, and jewelry from copper. Once the technology to work copper was developed, other metals were quickly identified. Ancient mines for softer metals like silver and tin can be found all over the world. About 5,500 years ago, in Africa and India first, then also in Europe and the Aegean within another hundred years after that, it was found that you could mix molten copper with molten tin and make the world's first intentional alloy. Bronze. Bronze was an alloy stronger and more durable than copper or tin alone or any previously available metal had been. It could cut through any copper weapon. Everything changed with this new technology, and this period became known as the Bronze Age. This was the true beginning of the art of metallurgy. Metallurgy is the technology of making and working metals and alloys. Let's go through some definitions so we'll be on the same page when it comes to metallurgy. Buckle up. In metallurgy, to temper a metal means to heat it, then cool it rapidly, to produce a more ordered atomic pattern and harden the metal. Firing a metal just means heating it in a flame. Working a metal usually means pounding it, sometimes while heated, into useful shapes. This is often seen when making swords and horseshoes. The ancient Japanese swordsmith learned that continually heating, folding, and quenching metal made for a beautiful and strong blade. Casting a metal is to melt it and pour it into a mold to make a metal object that might be difficult to work through other means. This is often used to make vessels for carrying water and statues. Stress is the force applied to a metal. Strain is the response of the metal to the stress. Hardness relates to the surface wear and abrasive resistance. Brittleness relates to a metal that breaks with little deformation and at low energy stress. Strength is a measure of the stress that can be applied to a metal before it permanently deforms or breaks. Yield strength is the resistance of a material to permanently bend or deform under stress. Tensile strength is the resistance of a material to break or fracture under stress. Flexibility is the measure of a metal's ability to return to its original shape after deformation. Toughness is a measure of how well the metal resists fracturing under stress. Weakness is the opposite of toughness, how easily a metal fractures under stress. Modulus itself means a constant factor or ratio. When you see the use of this term regarding metal, they are usually talking about Young's modulus. Young's modulus is also called the modulus of elasticity in tension and it measures the tensile stiffness of a solid material 
by calculating elasticity over stress. How much a metal gives over how much force you apply to it. Shear modulus is the ratio of shear or sideways stress to shear strain. You put a stress on two sides of a metal and measure the strain produced. A large shear modulus indicates a very rigid solid. Think of this as applying a force parallel to one side of a solid while using a counterforce to hold it in place. This is also sometimes called the modulus of rigidity. Stiffness relates to whether a metal bends under a load. Stiffness to weight ratio is the measure of a metal's mass efficiency in being able to provide resistance to elastic deformation. This can be measured as axial, which is the tensile modulus over the density, or by bending mode, which is the cube root of tensile modulus divided by density. Stiffness to weight bending ratio is the measure of a metal's ability to resist deformation divided by its density. The latent heat of fusion is at what temperature does a metal start melting. The latent heat of melting is the temperature at which all the metal has melted. Pitting resistance or pitting resistance equivalent number, PREN, is a predictive measure of a stainless steel's resistance to localized pitting corrosion based on its chemical composition. In general, the higher PREN value the more resistant the stainless steel is to localized pitting corrosion by chloride. Poisson's ratio is the measure of a material's change in width over change in length as the metal is stretched without breaking. Ductility is how easily a metal can be shaped and pulled into a wire. Resilience is the ability of a metal to absorb energy when it is deformed. Proof resilience is the maximum energy that can be absorbed without permanent deformation. Thermal diffusivity measures how quickly a material reacts to a change in temperature. How quickly does the change pass through the metal? Thermal shock resistance is the ability of a metal to withstand sudden temperature changes. Embodied carbon, energy, and water is the amount of these items needed to produce a unit mass of metal. Price of the metal is usually given in value per kilograms or tons such as $6.70 per kilogram for copper right now. Early metal workers tried to make other alloys, but nothing beat bronze for weapons and tool use for a long time. Iron had been discovered and worked just 1,000 years after copper, but pure iron is not much more useful than copper. It rusts easily and can be brittle if tempered to harden it. Iron was used for thousands of years before anyone discovered the secret of making steel. Sometimes a gift would be cast from the heavens down to the mortals. These falling stars, when they were found to have survived impact, sometimes had a metal in them that was remarkably strong and resistant to corrosion. Among the golden idols and jewels in the tomb of the Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun was found a unique dagger, fit for a king. This dagger was made from metal found in a fallen star. It could be pounded and shaped and would hold its luster and edge far longer than any other metal. For a long time, metallic meteorites were sought out for this reason and valued more than gold. But this metal was not some unknown element. It was an alloy of iron. A metallic meteorite will naturally contain iron and nickel with a small amount of other elements. Only about 5% of meteorites are metallic, but when these go through friction heating as they penetrate the atmosphere, then cool down after impact, they can create an alloy of iron and nickel. We call all alloys of iron steel. In the first century AD, artisans in China during the Warring States period, and artisans a little later in Damascus, Syria, discovered the secret to making an amazing alloy. It turns out that if we combine wrought iron with cast iron, or smelt a type of iron ore with high carbon content, found naturally in India and later manufactured in Morv or Khorasan, the atoms of iron and carbon will form an ordered pattern, like those in a crystal, producing another alloy of iron called carbon steel. The resulting alloy is much stronger than plain iron, and you didn't have to wait for a rock to fall from the stars. Damas means water in some Levantine languages, and Damascus, Syria, one of the oldest continually inhabited cities on earth, 
became famous for these beautiful and strong blades that were both hard and flexible at the same time. Both these blades would still rust unless they were cared for and oiled regularly, but they could hold a very sharp edge and were extremely strong. In the early 1800s, it was found that if we add an element called chromium to the iron, we can make a type of corrosion resistant steel that we call stainless steel, which is much more heat resistant and rust proof. Stainless steel means chromium steel and was named for an alloy developed in Sheffield, England in 1913. The top layer of these stainless steels oxidize, but just like aluminum, the oxygen cannot penetrate further into the metal, unlike iron, which will rapidly rust away. The age of stainless steel began. Everyone started making new alloys by adding elements recently clarified by Mendeleev. The addition of nickel increased resistance to corrosion. Adding molybdenum increased pitting resistance. Adding nitrogen increased mechanical strength. The percentage of these and other elements could be adjusted for different applications. Structural steel had to be extraordinarily strong, while surgical steel had to hold a very sharp edge. It was also found that stainless steel can also form two types of crystals, martensitic and austenitic. Martensitic, which forms a body-centered cubic and is called 400 series steel, works great for cutlery and knives holding a good edge, but it does not do well at cryogenic temperatures, becoming brittle and easy to fracture. Austenitic steel, which is called 300 series steel and has a face-centered cubic structure, is formable and strong, being particularly good for structural and transport products. It is very corrosion resistant and gets much stronger at cryogenic temperatures. Without affordable access to space and fully reusable spacecraft, humanity's endeavors to colonize the solar system are doomed. SpaceX wanted to build not just the largest and most capable spaceship ever flown, but a reusable ship, a true spaceship, not a single-use, outrageously expensive, hand-built vehicle like a Bugatti, but a tough, durable, reusable truck. As described in our lesson on aerospace composites, SpaceX had considered building the Starship out of carbon fiber composite, but composite materials become very brittle at cryogenic temperatures and cannot withstand a temperature higher than 200 centigrade. Since the Starship will use cryogenic liquid oxygen and methane and have to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, SpaceX went with 300 series austenitic steel, which as we discussed gets stronger at cryogenic temperatures. SpaceX first chose an alloy called 304 stainless steel to make their star hopper prototype. 304 steel is an alloy made mostly of iron, of course, with quite a bit of chromium and nickel. It also has small amounts of manganese, nitrogen, phosphorus, silicone, sulfur, and carbon. Adding more carbon can make a steel stronger but more brittle. Taking carbon away adds more flexibility, but it may buckle too easily. You may need more strength and be willing to sacrifice some flexibility at the base of a tank where the hoop and axial stress is higher than you do at the top where a more flexible alloy would work just fine and be more resistant to fracture. Starhopper was built of 304 stainless steel with 304L being used on some components. The L means lower carbon. Later SpaceX changed from 304 stainless steel to 301. 301 is what most of the pots and pans in your kitchen are made from. This seemed like an odd choice, but there were good reasons. The difference between 301 and 304 steel comes down to just a few changes. The 301 has 0.15% carbon, while the 304 has a little more than half as much at 0.08% carbon. The L versions of each of these have even less, of course. 301 has a maximum chromium content of 18%, versus 20% for 304. 301 has a maximum nickel content of 8%, while 304 goes up to 12%. One of the main differences between 301 and 304 stainless steel alloys is tensile strength. Tensile strength is the amount of pressure that each can take before experiencing mechanical failure. 301 is 33% stronger at normal temperatures than 304. 
At normal temperatures and a mildly corrosive environment, there is little difference between the two alloys related to corrosion. The lower chromium and higher carbon in the 301, however, make it a little more susceptible to corrosion. If you weld a piece of 301 steel, you will see some corrosion starting in the weld lines very quickly. This is because the chromium in the steel combines with carbon dioxide in the air when welded to form particles of chromium carbide that deplete the chromium in your alloy and weaken your starship at the weld line. What is the solution? SpaceX uses an annealing process to increase the corrosion resistance of the welded areas and adds reinforcing strips in high stress areas. 301 steel is only about 60% as strong in shear as in tension, so weld points between barrel sections are some of the first to fail under pressure testing. SpaceX has started using two parallel welds to strengthen this area. SpaceX has its engineers working on developing its own alloy of stainless steel specifically for Starship. This alloy will adjust the increments of non-iron elements to maximize the characteristics SpaceX needs to build a strong Starship capable of continuous use and thousands of missions. The transition to steel is a clear example of the genius of SpaceX and its founder. Genius is not always seeing what others do not. It is more often recognizing the importance of what others have ignored. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Support us on Patreon if you can, as we continue to prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Stay safe.